My name is Morba Ja, and I'm an aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I lead a transdisciplinary research program in space safety, security, and sustainability. And I've partnered with spacewatch.global to start a new series of web talks, cafes, space cafes called Morba's Vox Populi, which is Latin for people's voice. So I hope to see you there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be candid conversations about all sorts of stuff related to space safety, security, and sustainability. I am a space watcher. It's Thursday afternoon in Europe. It's Space Cafe Moriba's Vox Populi time. Our 10th edition will begin very soon. And as always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. Uh, so before we start, I would like to play out another uh, short clip for you uh, by a good friend of us, uh, by Valentin Eder and his te wonderful team who created a very nice uh, trailer that fits perfectly into our topic today. So stay tuned. We all know what we should do, but we don't do it. And I know space gets is increasingly crowded. When this happens in space, the horse is out of the barn, as we say in America, and it's hard to get the horse back in the barn. Uh, and uh, and we will have, I guess, to to deal with that. I'm still confident we will find solutions. Technically speaking, it's a, it's a, it, it's a rather it's rather you know simple, but uh, in terms of political will, it's rather complex. Great, at least there's some progress, and I'm happy to hear that. And the question is the way forward. Should we continue uh, in this way? Uh, Excellent question, and I can give a positive answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love that. I want to open it up to people here. I think the answer is yes. Uh, Unfortunately, objects as far as five, as small as five mil views can kill you. Right? It can, it can terminate a mission. We will dream our dreams of space ships and dream our dreams of bringing people up to moon and Mars, ignoring the environmental problem what is already existing there. The pictures and the sound installation should give a kind of reflection to this actual mantra situation, the frozen mantra situation. All the different parts and pieces uh, moving through the orbit have the very high potential of harming the next best satellite surrounding them. That way there is this ongoing festival of destruction that's happening right above our heads. My paintings try to compensate for us missing out on that. And the situation of space debris is as we such what I will call already beyond tipping point. I, I also uh, completely agree. This is a fascinating conversation. Thank you for this. It's, uh, it's really needed and we need to work this through. And I All right, well, anybody have any, any, anything they want to add on to that? Everyone else's point of view that there's, there's really no time to lose. I mean, or it's just the problem gets harder and harder. To... I don't know. These are all just ideas floating in my head and uh, your, uh, your concerns are duly noted, my friend. So I thank you very much. Fascinating conversation. It um, was really great to, to listen to all of you. So that gives us, I think, a great lead into our conversation today. I'm Torsten, publisher and Space Watcher. As you can see, Space Watch Global is a European our based our online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, the bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. The last one featured Stephen Ramage about the power of Earth observation and just give it a listen. It's 
Very fascinating stuff. So for all of our fans of audio content, we have new episodes in the Space Cafe radio section as well. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively to become a real space watcher, of course. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. With that, my job is done for the moment and I'd like to hand over to your host in Austin today. Moriba, over to you. Oh yeah. So um, I want to say hello, good day to everybody uh, spread across uh, humanity. Thanks for being with us once again for an excellent session of uh, Space Cafe's uh, Morbus Vox Populi. We have a very interesting, uh, you know, topic of discussion today, and we have some great guests that uh, you're going to be hearing from very soon. So let's kind of just get into this. One of the things that we're seeing, right, is we're seeing uh, an ever increasing growth of human made objects, anthropogenic objects in space. Um, there's a growth of debris for sure. Uh, we have more participants in this domain we do have space laws. These things are in treaties and, and these sorts of things. They're loosely interpreted or widely interpreted and implemented and these sorts of things. But, you know, with these treaties, we have uh, a convention on liability and damage. We see words like harmful interference. Uh, everybody should have free and unhindered uh, peaceful use of outer space, whatever that means. Um, there's not necessarily a definition of what harmful interference is. So this, you know, is subjective uh, by all means. And ultimately, because even though outer space may be infinite, near Earth space is quite finite. And we don't launch things just anywhere. We put things in specific orbital regimes or orbital highways, I like to call them that. Um, you know, working with comrades, around the globe in this idea of space environmentalism, uh, talking about carrying capacity of orbits and that sort of thing. Um, you know, some of these orbits may have already reached the saturation in their carrying capacity. Um, what does saturation look like? To me, it looks like, you know, our inability to prevent uh, undesirable things from happening. You know, so, so it's like, if our decisions and actions cannot uh, prevent bad things from happening and bad things can be collisions, but it also can be having to, you know, affect your mission operations because you have to maneuver so many times there's a cost of not being able to access a given location at a given time and these sorts of things. So I, 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 I want people to be able to understand that um, detriment isn't just creating more debris. Let's not just be so myopic and thinking like that's the only thing, but Detriment is also light pollution to astronomy. Detriment is also the cost of using propellant to have to, um, you know, move out of the way. And, 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 and these are all based on perception. And very recently, right, we saw that, um, you know, China basically, uh, you know, voiced, let's say, a complaint with, at the United Nations uh, regarding, um, you know, harmful interference. And I'm, I, I, I'm using those words. Um, I'm not, I'm not a real lawyer. I only play one on TV kind of thing. Um, and you know, was China justified in saying that, you know, Starlinks were a hazard, uh, you know, to, to its space station and that sort of stuff. We're going to see this more and more. Um, we see, you know, one web, uh, at some point in the past, I remember they said something against the Starlinks as well. Like, you know, we tried to, we try to call them and, they didn't answer the phone or, you know, the dog ate my homework kind of thing. Um, so this is just, this doesn't scale well. Uh, we need to figure this out. And, you know, one of the things that I'd also like to put out there is that when we talk about inferring stuff in space, inference is uniquely predicated on the evidence that you have. You know, you can only infer stuff based on the measurements, the, the observations, the information that you have 
available. You can't really infer beyond that, you know, by definition. And so when people are saying, hey, you behaved in this way that I feel was hazardous to me and you didn't do anything about it. And when the other person says, well, I really didn't see a hazard. Or I didn't consider one. It's never on the same body of evidence. Of course, they're going to have different ideas about stuff. This really gets to the heart of the lack of data sharing hurts because different people with different evidence come to different conclusions. And sometimes these conclusions can be completely opposite of each other. And for whatever reason, we as humans tend to believe, well, um, because I don't really know if people are intentionally trying to be harmful, I'm going to apply prejudice and I'm just going to assume malintent. I'm going to assume that people are being harmful intentionally and that sort of stuff, or they don't care, that sort of thing. I think that's very dangerous for us to just apply prejudice to get rid of our ignorance just because we don't like sitting in discomfort. Um, so anyway, I've said quite a bit. Um, that's just kind of my, my opener right there. I have some great people here. I have Holger, I have Jinyuan, um, uh, Guayu is supposed to dial in. I don't see him yet. And I have Michael. So anyways, with that said, I'm going to leave it up to my guests. Anything that you'd like to, to say, weigh in on based on what I just said. Well, if no one else is going to start, I will. Um, and I, I just want to uh, suggest that the two incidents last year where China felt the need to, to move its space station could be the result of, of two um, different uh, factors. One of which is that, that the Chinese Space Agency and SpaceX might just have different decision-making matrices. Um, and and that, that's perfectly plausible because um, the Chinese are operating a uh, spacecraft with human beings inside and SpaceX is operating uh, robotic satellites. And therefore you might expect the Chinese space agency to want a larger buffer than SpaceX. Um, so it could just be simple differences in decision-making matrices, um, which could then be exacerbated. And this is the second possible explanation by um, a, um, a lack of an effective communication mechanism between those two operators. That's what we saw back in 2019 when the European Space Agency uh, had to move one of its uh, Earth imaging satellites because SpaceX wasn't responding to emails. It was the simple lack of an effective communication uh, channel. Um, so obviously China and SpaceX need to get together and figure out how to talk to each other on an urgent basis. Um, and the last thing I'll say here is that the Chinese government did the right thing in notifying uh, the United Nations. Um, it wasn't a, uh, uh, a claim, it wasn't uh, uh, a legal action, it was the conveying of information. And hopefully that will encourage operators of all kinds to improve their, their communication channels ASAP. Excellent. I think these are great points, Michael. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Jinyuan, Holger, anything? Um, hi, um, can you hear me well? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Long? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, it's, it's great to, to be back again. And um, I, I think, um, well, outer space is, is, is just like, you know, the high seas, you know, these common areas where, you know, different entities, they, they can conduct, you know, their own activities. And sometimes we, 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 we often say that, uh, you know, um, they have concurrent rights and there's no hierarchy. Normally there's no hierarchy between these freedoms, you know, enjoyed by different entities. Um, and that gives rise to problems. You know, sometimes, you know, for instance, as the, as, you, as both Mariba and Michael mentioned, you know, in the two incidents last year, um, so the situation, you know, was um, that, you know, 
China, I think China, uh, and I, I agree with Michael that, you know, um, there were probably different you know, decision make, making processes or outcomes uh, because they, they were astronauts on board in the China space station. So I presume, you know, the Chinese, they, I, I think they, um, they were more cautious than, than Elon Musk did. Um, so they maneuvered the, the, the space station and, and I also agree that, you know, the other, you know, reason which gave rise to the problem is the lack of, uh, of uh, effective communication. And, and I, I think in the, in the, in the American not very bio, it was stated very clear that, you know, um, in the US is very good at this and, Whenever there's a there's a threat or there's a, a danger in you know the U.S. would usually notify the other party and I I agree you know the U.S. is really good at this, uh, but the problem is due to the lack of effective communication, you know this would give rise to problems. You know I'm not sure where you know in, in particular when when I was a child you know when you come across a, another guy face to face and you were trying to you know avoid him or her. And and it happens that he or she also tend to the other tend to that way, and you bump together. So the lack of uh, of uh, effective communication can give us problems. Even if even if Starlink is really good at avoiding the collisions, you know, automatically. So I think that that sometimes that would give us problems, and this is important. Um, I am. Yep. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, man, but I I. I... The, the, the whole effective communication thing, I think, is something that's very important. And people in general, at least in the United States, they just, the assumption, and this is unofficial, right? This is just me in rooms talking to colleagues and stuff. They're like, ah, oh, people in China, they just don't read their email or they, they just neglect their email or they don't, you know. So, so here's a question to you, right? Culturally yep. speaking, culturally mm -hmm. speaking, uh -huh. What do you consider a good mechanism for effective communication with with China? Is 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 it an email? Is an email? Uh, uh, do you consider that effective? Like, what is a mechanism that you feel would be culturally well received to effectively um, communicate these things? Um, I, I don't think email is an effective way. You know, culturally speaking. Yeah. Um. And um, you know, people. You know, they read email and. And sometimes, you know, um, there's a lag, there's a serious lag. And I think the most effective way is to just to have a hot, hotline, I mean, mm -hmm. by which people can talk directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so voice to voice is, is important culturally in terms of being able to communicate these things. I, I think so, yeah. That, that's, my, that's my obvious, that's my point, my personal view, but I think that okay. it's... Uh, can, can, can I add something uh, to this very interesting uh, thing? So um, it, in this case, it was a manned spacecraft, but you also have unmanned spacecraft that are very expensive. Uh, and ESA is flying a lot of them. So uh, every asset we are flying is, is several hundreds of millions. And, and that means we are very cautious, uh, but that also means it's a heavy machine and you need to start a bit earlier with the preparation of the maneuver. So, um, you know, uh, a small spacecraft with a high degree of automation can wait to the last minute. And that's important to know. Uh, they can wait to the last minute and that's very efficient because very often it turns out in the last minute that the risk is gone, uh, you know, due to several effects. Uh, and, and by that, the big machines like the ones we are flying will have already have to, de to be decided uh, hours ago. And for a space station, I can imagine the processes are even longer. So you don't know, you don't know if SpaceX probably had planned to maneuver uh, in the last minutes. And when you don't ask, um, you cannot just, my advice would be not to move just uh, the space station without being certain uh, that the other spacecraft will not move as well. Uh, because otherwise, as you nicely described, you don't solve the problem. So um, in any case, uh, you know, you need to ask, you need to, you need to get together. 
Uh, and of course, it's not the ideal outcome is always the more expensive spacecraft has to maneuver. <laughs> that's, that's, of course, not sustainable, where it is much easier for the other ones uh, uh, to do. My experience, though, is that today we have nothing else in place. You have to phone or you have, you have to write an email. But my advice is to do that, uh, to do at least this. Um, and, and, I, and I don't know if, if it was done for the space station. Uh, because if you do it, you get a reply. Uh, the fact that ESA didn't get a reply uh, two years ago was an exception. So we, we usually get the, get the reply. And uh, and today we have nothing else in place. Um, so we have, we have to do it. And I must say, honestly, I don't get replies from many countries uh, where, you know, this email is not read. <laughs> I have to say this. Uh, and, and, and here we have to work. Um, and I agree, email is not the solution. Absolutely not. It's, it's not operational. And also, you don't want to spend your whole day writing emails, because uh, I can tell you from our perspective, half of the conjunctions, and they're around 200 warnings, so uh, in a day, uh, would mean writing 100 emails. So that doesn't work. Uh, there needs to be something automated. Uh, and it must be some sort of database or coordination mechanism, which is also fail safe because emails can fail. Two years we had the example somewhere it got stuck and you don't get the reply anymore. So we need we need something professional, automated, um, and uh, operational. Very cool. I appreciate that, uh, Holger. I know that um, I know. That Angela uh, Matisse um, wants to say something. Uh, so let's let's bring Angela online and see how she wants to chime in here. No, yeah, I, you know, I agree. Communication, the right communication and culture is great. But I want to link this up with um, the last Space Cafe Moscow that our colleague, uh, part of the Space Watch Global had, was with uh, three gentlemen, and forgive me, my memory, this thing was has been recorded, and it's uh, it was also simultaneously translated because it was one of the uh, space cafe Moscow things. They they talked about, and I want to put this to, this to you. They um, said that actually um, the Starlink were relying on NASA, and that is correct. Nothing was wrong, and it was the protocols that would be used. And China was um, was using the act was was using another protocol. So they actually said the outcome of this and their recommendation is when all of the um, United Nations regulations or or guidelines were written, there was not this congested, contested level of complexity. And so it's the fact that we've outstripped and that there are two conflicting documents. Now, I'm not expert like Mariba. I don't even pretend on TV to be an expert lawyer in this. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I heard this saying that it's actually it's outdated regulations and two that can give conflicting views. And that's what's happening. And so that's that's solvable. Right. But I put it to you guys who are following all of this. Thank you. Over. It looks like Michael has uh, something to say. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that uh, on the world's oceans and in international airspace, we have rules of the road. Um, so, for instance, a uh, motorized vessel has to give way to a vessel that's under sail. Um, we should try to develop multilateral standards uh, for space. And, and what I would suggest is that a, uh, a spacecraft with human beings inside should have priority over a robotic spacecraft. Um, now, I, I don't want to presume any other rules in advance, but the fact that, that the world's countries have done this with regards to other areas beyond national jurisdiction means that it can be done here. Um, and these rules of the road are important because as Mariba mentioned in the introduction, there are possible incentives uh, to operators uh, to avoid making unnecessary maneuvers to uh, uh, to save thruster fuel or to um, avoid a, a service disruption. So we need to make sure that that we don't get games of chicken in orbit. 
and, and rules of the road are one thing that we can add uh, to the toolbox of solutions. So I 100% I agree with the rules on the road. I think that is um, an indispensable uh, tool that we need uh, to help um, you know, with space traffic. One of the things that I'm going to put in here, and um, you know, I, I, I mentioned it earlier, because I think people really, really, really need to hear this, is that the evidence by which things are inferred is not the same. That's part of the problem. So when you have like the thing with the high seas in, in, in the air, both, both parties can see what's happening for the most part. Um, both parties can say, hey, that's a, a, a vessel with a sail versus a blah, blah, blah. But with the whole space thing, when China has its own sensors and it's coming up with its own you know, idea or inference of what's happening, and the US and SpaceX has its own, they might reach very different conclusions because it's different bodies of evidence. And even if they apply the rules of the road, they may be applying rules for totally different scenarios. That's no good. The evidence by which people are making the decisions needs to be common. That is something that we need to achieve. There needs to be some level of common evidence that people can draw from so that the conclusions are at least consistent. If that doesn't happen, man, it's like, I don't know, right? It's like if I'm in my car and I've got 2100 vision, uncorrected kind of stuff, right? And somebody else has 2020, we're gonna be making different decisions on the road because we, we don't have the same perception of what reality is. That is an issue that we need to strike big time. So, so what you're saying, Michael, is critical, but this common pool of evidence getting to that is also very critical. I think uh, that's one of the big differentiators between these other domains is that in some these other domains, it's evident what the scenario is in space. Two different people with two different bodies of evidence have different conclusions oftentimes, which sucks a lot. But Holger, go ahead. Yeah, I want to underline what, what you said. We don't have the same evidence everywhere. This is the problem. Uh, different sources of information, potentially conflicting results. And uh, as you said, Michael, uh, absolutely. For me, uh, uh, stations with human lives must have absolute priority in, in everything. It starts already from the launch. When we launch something, even at, before we launch, uh, we are already watching, are we coming close uh, to any any sort of manned uh, vehicle. Uh, but I wanted to say something that might, sh might shock uh, some of you. <laughs> I, I, in any case, it shocks the operators that I talk to is, is that collision avoidance is a mitigation action not to protect your spacecraft, but to protect the environment. And that is often forgotten because um, uh, your spacecraft it's much more likely that your spacecraft is killed by something you, you will never be able to see, to see because there are so many small objects up there which we can't track. Mm -hmm. um, so when you compare this to motor boats and sailing boats, uh, they want to protect themselves. Uh, but, uh, you know, two unmanned spacecraft, there's no doubt, manned spacecraft must have absolute protection and priority. Uh, but two unmanned spacecraft, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if one is small or one is big. The consequence will be that both die and that a large cloud of fragment is left behind being a pain for anybody else. And that's actually what we are afraid of. We are not, not afraid. We are also afraid of losing spacecraft for sure, yes. But we are uh, even more afraid of polluting the being responsible for a cloud of, of space debris with the pain for everybody else operating in the environment. And that's why this is a mitigation action also, and not only a protection action. Thanks for that, Holger. I see that we have somebody in the audience that wants to ask somebody something AC. Hello. AC, you're muted. AC, you're muted. 
All right. Uh, looks like, just looks like... takes a just takes a question from the Q and A. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. It seems like AC has the question here. Considering the current global situation of major nation states that act in completely lawless and for simple, peaceful international norms, what makes us think that something as complex as coordinated orbital occupancy in LEO will be adhered to when even only one bad actor, rogue nation, can Kessler humanity into an orbital no-go zone at will? So what can be done to live with this problem that likely will be, yeah, uh, I don't know. I try to I try to just read what AC said, but it's not extremely coherent. So, uh, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a try at answering that. Um, first, all the major satellite operators have a common interest in preventing uh, an increase in debris. Um, it's almost a situation of mutually assured destruction. If you you take risks and you create debris, you put your own spacecraft at increased risk. So, so there's a common interest here for the, the main operators. And, and so you don't even need law with regards to, to generating that self-interest. But the other thing that we should talk about at some point is if we do get a collision and you know, the European Space Agency loses a very expensive Earth imaging satellite, um, we get into circumstances where liability becomes an issue and, and what legal recourses are available. Um, and, and we'd have to establish, uh, you know, first of all, causation. Who you know, was it, this spacecraft that crashed into that spacecraft? But more importantly, we need to establish fault because fault is the standard uh, in orbit under the liability uh, convention and, and will also be the standard if a case is brought in a national legal system. So what constitutes fault with respect to, to spacecraft operation? And I would suggest here that um, we do have standards. Um, they're soft law standards, but let's say the international uh, interagency debris uh, committee uh, as a 25 year deorbit standard. So if the spacecraft hadn't been deorbited within 25 years and then caused a collision, well, that, that looks like fault. Um, we may also be seeing uh, you know, new uh, standards. If you were to launch a mega constellation now without end of life deorbiting capabilities, that would probably constitute fault by global satellite industry standards, not, not written down standards, but what what do the majority of operators now do? Um, and that's where we need to, to be thinking about moving forward is what, what is actually the best practice? And if you're not engaging in best practice and you cause an accident and you cause loss, financial loss or the loss of human life, then you can be held to account either in the international mechanism or perhaps more significantly, um, in, let's say, a U.S. court with a massive damage award um, and the ability to enforce that judgment against assets located in the United States, which for a major company or a large foreign state is a very effective enforcement mechanism. Uh, yeah, th thanks for that. And before we go to, to, to Jin Yuan, um, th this idea of fault, I think, is very interesting um, because fault has to be determined through some sort of causality, right? And then it's like, you know, what evidence, what, what evidence demonstrates causality? If, if multiple hypotheses explain the evidence and these can be conflicting, is it a percentage? Uh, you know, is it just the possibility that it might be a cause? Like to what, it, you know, it's like, um, so what, one of the things that I'm, I'm just going to bring up here, and, and it's like one of these, it's a formalism uh, in what's called dimensions of data quality. So in dimensions of data quality, for, for, formally, these are understood as things like accuracy, timeliness, uniqueness, consistency, validity, uh, 
uh, and even com you know completeness. And I'm going to define a data set or evidence to be complete if and only if the evidence allows one hypothesis to be concluded or, 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 or one, one, one conclusion. If, you, if deduction can be uh, applied to, from the evidence, if you can apply deductive reasoning, that is a complete set of evidence. Meaning, and I, I, sorry to beat the horse dead here because I just assume that not everybody is gonna be familiar with these terms, but in deductive reasoning, Basically, it's a logical statement. Given this, this is you know this is what follows, and and it's it's there's no room for ambiguity. It's it's given this, this is what follows. A complete body of evidence, or not, or a body of evidence is say, said to be complete, if and only if it allows for deduction. So, rarely, rarely, in space stuff, do we have a complete set of data right because i don't know russia blew up this thing uh maybe you know sometime down the road somebody's satellite gets schwacked by a piece of debris from the russian stuff can we is is, is the evidence only allow that to be the only conclusion to be drawn from what the anomaly that somebody experienced and that's really tough to do in space especially given that we don't share data and all this other stuff so so I, I agree with everything that you said, Michael. I also want to point out to people that this idea of the fault piece, uh, that's something that we have to work on with evidence and stuff. But if I could just say quickly, yeah, with regards to two operational spacecraft colliding with each other, okay, you're going to have pretty clear causation with the, the level of, of space situational awareness today. Um, the, 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 the tricky issue is what is... What do you do with regards to a knock-on collision? So, so there's, there's an initial co collision, there's a creation of debris, and one of those debris pieces then takes out another satellite. And that's where people like you, Mariba, and companies like Privateer are going to be providing evidence to international claims commissions or to domestic courts. The knock-on collisions are the challenge. Um, the, the, the initial collisions between two operational satellites, um, that's going to be fairly easy to establish. And the question is going to be, were those two operators acting in accordance with best practice? Right, right. Genuine, I, I don't, I don't want to leave you out, man. So, so go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. So with, with respect to the question AC raised, I, I echo, you know, Michael's view. Um, I'm also very optimistic that you know these major spacefaring countries they have the willingness to you know uh, solve the problems and and to adhere to them because ultimately it's in their long term interest to have a sustainable outer space environment. So I'm I'm I, I agree. Um, with, with respect to the regime of thought, I I, I think uh, and I agree. Um, Sometimes it's, it would be very complicated, you know, for instance, it, in the situation of, you know, the China Space Station starting thing. Um, so, for instance, if, if the Chinese Space Station did not maneuver, and if there were a, a, a collision, probably China would say, well, the trajectory of, uh, of, uh, of the Chinese Space Station is well known, it's public, and and visibly, you should have the have, have, have the obligation to avoid it. But if China maneuvers, it, it could be it could become more complicated because that would make the you know the attribution of fault more complicated than in the case of uh, no maneuver. And I think this showcases the importance of um, space traffic management or rule of load load in outer space. So we need to have a set of uh, rules and we in place. Uh, we, whereby people can determine who is acting, you know, uh, you know, I mean, in a good will and, and, and not or not. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, so, so, so the thing that I find interesting, right? If people are acting in good will or not. So when I was, when I was, I started off my, my, my space career really as a, as a security guard in the air force, in the U S air force, I was, I was a security guard. My job was to guard, 
um, Minuteman 2 and Minuteman 3 intercontinental ballistic missiles in the state of Montana. Um, and one of the things that I was taught was that a threat required the existence of three ingredients concurrently, opportunity to cause harm, capability to cause harm, and intent. So the, so the idea of good, you know, was this, you know, are they behaving, you know, good or, or bad? This starts getting to trying to infer intent. I got to tell you, there's no sensor that exists that measures intent, right? So this is one of the things that I think we need to, uh, we need to be very careful um, in how we proceed and, and getting to the idea of fault and just reading the convention of liability and damage kind of in front of me on my other screen is this idea of establishing what is due diligence, right? And this kind of gets to what Michael was talking about. If these things collide, what did these people know before and did they, did they behave in a way that constitutes due diligence in trying to uh, you know, mitigate you know, this collision or, 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 or whatever the harmful uh, interference was. So I think, I think that's quite interesting. You still have your hand up, Yen Wan. Do you want to say no. something else or? No, 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 that's it. So, oh, so Mike, Michael, before I get to you, I just want to bring in very quickly, Catherine Courtney. Uh, let's bring you on stage just very quickly. And, and I'm sure that both Michael and uh, Holger have stuff to say. Oh, hi. Um... Sorry, I'll take my mask off. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear <laughs> Sorry. you. Um, I've been following the discussion with interest from the train. Um, what I wanted to go back to was the, the discussion around communication protocols. Um, because I think, you know, there are ways that we can take incremental steps towards improving the situation. And um, it was mentioned the um, IADC standards, long-term sustainability guidelines, et cetera. I think what's missing from that uh, portfolio of international standards are data standards and data sharing protocols, which, which would help you get closer to that single version of the truth um, and communication protocols you know, that everyone has agreed, uh, both commercial operators and, and um, institutions, you know, how they're going to communicate uh, in the event of a, a close approach. And I'm just curious what the panel feel, you know, who's, whose job is it to try and push forward on um, standards in those two areas? Yeah, nice. Um, anybody? Yeah. I have a very clear opinion on that. Yeah, well, we, the, we love your clear opinions, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> it should be the space operators. Um, because uh, my experience is, if you want a high quality flight rules uh, accepted by everybody on international level, it's the community of operators um, that would establish this through basically working practice. Um, look. Um, all the, the mitigation requirements that we have uh, today in the laws, they are not invented by, uh, let's say, let's put it by, by those that do the policies or the politics in, in the United Nations. No, they were invented by, by engineers and experts uh, that were hands-on with the topic and they recommended them as a, as a, as a good um, technical measure with some international consensus. Um, and it, through a relatively short process of five or six years, this, this got uh, promoted to a de facto, to de facto regulation. And I think for that topic of space traffic management, we could go the same route. If, if there's a good working practice between operators, a protocol established, a standard, what data must be in there, orbit state, capability to maneuver, time to the next uplink, uh, Time, time left to the maneuver, uh, maximum amount of data, we, you know, very quickly to arrange between operators. When this is established, it will end up in a CCSDS standard. Uh, and from there, it will, it will, uh, politicians will take it up uh, and promote it to regulation, I'm pretty sure. If we all decide to wait for uh, politicians to, <laughs> to come up with these rules, uh, we will wait forever. So my, my, my call is uh, let us operators uh, and experts uh, get together and just establish a good working practice. 
Thanks, Holger. Uh, Michael. Well, the first thing to say, Mariba, is that we don't need to prove intention here. This is about negligence. This is uh, about fault uh, for not meeting uh, required standards of behavior. Um, so if an operator were to launch a dumb satellite that didn't have maneuverability in 2022, that would clearly not be best practice. And if there was a collision, then you know they're at fault. They, they're, they're, their only intention may have been to save money, right? And not intending to cause a collision. Um, so no, intention is, is not required. And I'd also like to just, while I have the floor, flag two other issues. The first is uh, kinetic anti-satellite weapons tests. Um, Russia uh, struck one of its own satellites on November 15th, um, created quite a bit of debris, um, a fair bit of which is trackable. Now, if one of those trackable pieces were to take out a European Space Agency satellite, uh, I would suggest that uh, establishing fault would be relatively easy. If you're going to uh, do a test like this at 800 kilometers, um, there's a, you know, it's pretty obvious that you're putting other spacecraft at risk. Um, the other thing just to mention are rocket bodies. Um, we have a lot of companies that are continuing to abandon rocket bodies in orbit when we actually have the technology and the mission profiles to bring them down in, in a controlled manner. Um, and so we need to, to raise some of our expectations with regards to, uh, to behavior in orbit um, and, and create um, standards of best practice that uh, uh, will encourage operators to do better and also enable us to hold them to account if something does go wrong in a collision with them. Michael, awesome. Jin Yuan? Yes, I, I just wanted to respond very briefly to, to Catherine's question with respect to um, communication protocol. And I, I agree that, uh, you know, I agree with Greg that this should follow a bottom-up approach. And we actually have seen that, you know, for instance, in space debris mitigation, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a cost part guidelines, for example. Um, um, but, but this should not, I mean, Debars from you know, for instance, establishing a, a working group, for instance, in the corpus, in the, in particular, in the scientific and technology subcommittee, um, which would consist of uh, technicians rather than politicians. Um, so, so I, I think I, I agree. And uh, sometimes it's also important to to maybe to work from the level of politicians because without without the, I mean, the willingness from their side, you know, it is infeasible for technicians to work together in, you know, in particular in between countries, you know, which have no cooperation in space at all nowadays. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jin Yuan. Let's see if um, we have anybody else from the audience that we can bring into this. Uh, how about, uh, how about Martin Michel? Not Mark, not Mark Meyer, Martin Michel. There's a question in the Q&A here. Uh, yeah, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh yeah, nice, uh, yeah. Uh... Uh, thank you very much for bringing me live. Um, yeah, um, I raised this question. Um, it was uh, regarding your uh, former remarks, Moriba, on um, that operators have different assessment of the same situation, of the same uh, conjunction. Um, I think that it would be a good approach to, um, to that, that the operators, the best solution would be if they share all their data. Typically, they have um, very good uh, ephemerates of their own satellites. And if they don't want to share their data or they, they have safety or economic concerns about this, um, they have to take the burden of maneuvering. Yeah, um, I think this should be the solution. And this should be, and this can be then um, a baseline for other rules that apply later because we have to 
we have the same assessment of the same situation because before that we cannot apply any other following rules that are based on other approaches because as you mentioned they would have different um yeah solutions for this so i would suggest that uh, yeah data sharing is the solution i know that's a big problem um and if they do not uh, they should move yeah look i i think i think that's awesome and th thank you so much for that um there's actually a project that i'm working on uh with nasa right now um where basically we're we're evaluating this sort of stuff and along with what you're saying the rules that we're trying to establish is um, when an, just like when people file a flight plan with their aircraft, um, that flight plan when accepted gives them the right of way, so to speak, uh, on the airways. We're actually considering that for orbit where, uh, an owner operator can file their orbital plan and say for the next, uh, you know, N hours or N days, this is the trajectory of all my satellites and have some sort of, and it doesn't have to be a governmental body at first. This, I love the bottoms up approach where people just get together, but it's like, okay, if this, if this uh, joint group or consortium of operators says, yep, you filed your orbital plan and we checked it out and wh whatever the criteria is, you're a go, man, you have the right of way there. And if somebody else isn't sharing their stuff, then yes, they should have the burden of having to, to move. Um, that is something that we're considering. And I, and I, anyway, I just wanted to underscore this and just say that uh, I think it's a good idea, not because mm -hmm. I'm looking into it, but I, in general, I think it's not a bad idea. So, um, so thank you. I'm going to bring Meidad Pariente. Thanks, Moriba. Thanks, everybody. It's so uh, interesting to uh, hear all the approaches. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, propose uh, an approach that uh, is uh, direct continuity of what you said, Moriba. Um, the space traffic control, exactly like the air traffic control. Um, as you know, the operators already joined and most of the satellite operators agree on new, uh, uh, let's call it a space conduct regarding uh, orbit. And I think uh, this kind of organization can be operated by uh, commercial space operators. And this uh, organization, or, or maybe UNUSA or both, uh, this organization uh, could act as a, a body that will decide who should maneuver and why. Of course, uh, you, you can do that uh, and allow people uh, uh, to send reservations if they have to. I assume that since about 80% of active satellites by 2024 will be commercial, uh, then uh, there will always be governmental or, or secret projects that uh, will not uh, pay into this uh, rule of uh, the road, but still the 80-20 effort is uh, good enough as, as a starting point. And since I assume that uh, all of us want to uh, sustain uh, space use for, for uh, everybody and have a, a bona fide in their activities, um, I think that uh, we, we, we could find a lot of support uh, according uh, to uh, what I see and I hear from other operators. And uh, this uh, kind of uh, unbiased body could actually uh, resolve every conflict uh, whenever it happens uh, regarding uh, maneuverability and, and uh, maintaining a safe path or, or uh, super highways in, in, uh, in uh, Leo and uh, Mio. Thanks a lot, May that appreciate that. Um, let's see. Any anybody from 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 the guests have something that they they feel that they'd like to put into the to the bucket of things that we've been discussing? How about um, uh, I guess Mark Meyer? Can we bring Mark Meyer on to ask a question? 
Yes, hi guys. What's up, man? So I was on a conference uh, for the US Air Force Academy, as you know, from the Space Command. And we discussed a lot of space law in a soft law way because it's not binding and you could find a way to get together easily. So that might be a good beginning to start for more LTS guidelines and stuff like this and wait till the courts and the governments came of the awareness and they have to judge cases. So later on, we will get uh, to know what is a good behavior and what is wrongful. I like that. Uh, Michaels has something to say. Yeah, very quickly. Um, all of those international guidelines are evidence of, of what is um, best practice, what is, what is reasonably expected of space operators. So even though they're not legally binding in themselves, in the event of a collision, they could be looked at by a claims commission internationally or a domestic court as, um, as an indication of uh, of whether or not there was a uh, fault. So uh, yeah, absolutely. These things are important. Uh, like I said, if, if you have not deorbited the satellite within 25 years of the end of its operational life, you're gonna be at fault because that is at a minimum uh, the standard. I, I think the standard is for a more rapid deorbit than 25 years now, but if you're over 25 years, you're just asking to be sued. I have, I have a question uh, for, for, for everybody, especially, um, you know, my, my guests on this. When we talk about this kind of harmful interference stuff, by and large, we're still talking about collisions and these sorts of things. Um, you know, and one of the things that I brought up is uh, also the idea of not being able to access a particular point in space at the time that you wanted, right? So it's like, um, people have ground stations uh, where they need to dump data, and if you miss if you miss that opportunity, there's a cost to having data on board that 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 you you now you're behind. Because um, I I think people don't realize most of the computation of stuff does not happen on orbit. We still we still by and large have like you know Commodore sixty fours flying up there. It's not like we have. Um, you know, supercomputer on every satellite. And a lot of the data just needs to be processed on the ground. And the pipe to dump the data uh, is very narrow. And even though you have companies that purport being, you know, con you know communications and look, a lot of that is vaporware, to be honest with you, because I've been doing my own research and it's the, the pipelines to get things to the ground are very small, narrow, far few in between. So, would people agree that harmful interference is also, you know, uh, if if somebody does something that makes me have to change my data downlink plan and all this other stuff, would that constitute harmful interference uh, in your opinions? In, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, in my opinion, yes. Um, also, if a certain orbital regime is so busy that you have to move into a suboptimal uh, orbital regime, which is, you know, your mission is not ideally suited to, uh, we should not forget this. Uh, but also, I want to stress that collisions are not a bilateral thing. Um, just to give you an example, uh, the, the collision that happened in 2009, every second collision avoidance maneuver that we have to do is because of one of these fragments. So to whom do I have to send the bill? It, it doesn't help me if, if Russia and US find a solution on who is responsible for that because I still have the damage uh, of, of doing uh, avoidance maneuvers. So uh, that's, that's, that means there, there's more than just two in the game. Yeah? Absolutely, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Jin Yuan. <laughs> Yes, on Mariba, your, your, the question you raised, I, I, my answer is yes. It's, uh, I think that's a situation of uh, humble interference. But the problem is, you know, in, in such areas as outer space, you know, you know I, I think each, each and every, you know, entity 
has to tolerate some some level of uh, interference from others, because there are usually you know different you know um, interests at stake, and we need to balance them. Sometimes you know uh, I think it is not only important to focus on the obligation of avoiding harmful interference, but sometimes it's also this is mature. I mean. I mean, the obligation of due regard to the interest of, uh, of e each other. And I, I think that's also important. But the uh, quick, the, I mean, the, the, the question, my view is yes. Very cool. Look, um, I, think, I think sometimes we, we, we go all the way up to like, you know, uh, 15 past the hour, but we don't necessarily have to do that. I think one of the that I'd like to do, because I, I don't really see um, a whole lot more Q and A thing. Well, hold on. Let's see. Um, Joseph Guzman, do you want to come on on stage and ask, participate? Yes. Hello. Can Can you hear me? Yep. Wonderful. I'm uh, dialing in from the National Space Symposium here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Of right. course, am a uh, colleague of yours, also from the Austin area. And, okay, uh, nice. I've uh, created a startup, and uh, one of the chief uh, problems I'm looking at to solve or to uh, uh, add capability to, not necessarily to solve, but to help to be part of the solution is the space debris problem. And uh, I've been uh, involved in space operations uh, with the Department of Defense and specifically the U.S. Army for about the past uh, 19 years, ending my career there in the 2020 timeframe and started this uh, small but small but small business and one of the uh, of course hurdles to get over uh, with respect to actually taking action against space debris is to find funding uh, to actually take action uh, many of the venture capitalists and uh, the small business uh, innovation research programs with the u.s government require us to create a commercialization plan. And this is, uh, I'm finding to be, uh, a re I guess uh, the community is very receptive to the need to deal with debris, but nobody wants to pay for it. And so developing a commercial plan uh, to actually add funding, to create capabilities that actually uh, do something about this problem is, is my, is my challenge right now and i just asked for the community's uh, input uh, in helping me do that you know i've i've looked at commercial uh, i'm sorry uh, insurance uh, companies that uh, provide coverage to satellite operations they are interested in reducing risk to the satellites that they cover obviously uh, so that they can uh, reduce the, the the risk of them having to pay out on a collision uh, that's one avenue of course there's this uh, goodwill. The operators wanting to have a clean environment, but the question is how much are they willing to pay for? And uh, you know that's a that's a new business expense that is added into their business plans, and and our our, our collective uh, needs to uh, be able to address that also in their costs over to the community. And thanks for your, uh, the opportunity to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I think you made some good points. Um, is there an, another question from Medad Pariente? Uh, actually, it wasn't a question. It, it was uh, just um, thinking out loud. Uh, and, OK, go uh, ahead and think out loud, man. Do it. <laughs> and touching on the last point, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we should, as operators, involve the uh, space insurance and underwriting uh, market. Sure. Uh, the brokers and the underwriters, they have tremendous power. Uh, and they can uh, affect uh, uh, good behavior without using too much coercion. The fact that uh, the third-party liability is... Uh, for many operators is a precondition for uh, uh, use of satellites in space and the fact that the launch premium 
sometimes could uh, be a significant amount of the total uh, uh, cost of a project. This, there should be uh, sanctions to whomever uh, jeopardize the safe uh, use of space. Um, because I, I, I saw that uh, the, the idea of uh, space traffic control, unlike air traffic control, you can't really enforce anything. You can just suggest you can't really enforce the satellites are in, in space. But yes, you can, you can still sanction by increasing the premium or even refusing a third party liability to a rogue operator. Yeah, so, so here's the thing, man. So, you know, right now there really isn't this third party liability insurance in, uh, on orbit. And most people that insure stuff, it's really launch. There's some people that insure stuff in geo, but most of the stuff in Leo isn't. So what, why, why do you, why do you, why do you think, uh, why do you think that is, man? I mean, it, space insurance can be powerful, but clearly, you know, that's not the thing that's regulating stuff. Mm -hmm opinion is there's just a lack of evidence like what's the evidence that they can base all this stuff off of right like insurance is powerful in as much as they have evidence to uh to apply their 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 insurance muscles but in well, the absence of that you know what do they have to you know what what do they have to lean on yeah that's true uh, mariba but uh, i can share with you i'm about to renew my uh uh, third-party liability, my license, license for uh, three uh, uh, satellites I'm operating, the three diamonds. This is the sixth year. They are registered uh, in the uh, UK, and the UK Space Agency will not renew my license unless I have a proof of third-party liability for the next 12 months. So um, if the Space Agency in the UK does that, I assume that any space agency can do that and condition the license to have a third party liability. Yeah, it, it can happen. Uh, I, I agree that, that it's something that other places could do. Um, but yeah, very cool. No, I, I, I appreciate your input, Maydad. Um, all right. Uh, I, I I would say this. Look, it's it's ten after. Um, why don't we go go with final statements uh, from from my guests, and then we can wrap this up, shall we? So let let's start with uh, genuine. Any final comments? Um. Yeah, I, I think you know. So the topic today is about the two incidents last year, and I I think you know such incidents would you know happen you know um, more and more in the future, in particular with the. Uh, deployment of, uh, of uh, low uh, orbit uh, small satellites. And I think this is important and it's an issue that we really need, we need to deal with um, probably in the second stage of uh, long-term sustainability of um, outer space activities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go with uh, Michael. Very briefly, um, we can do this we can solve these problems. There's such a strong mutual interest in preserving safe access to orbit. Um, so despite the, the, the serious challenges, um, I, I'm very optimistic on this particular issue. Oh yeah, my brother, agreed. Holger. Yeah, uh, we have seen it's not, not easy to find rules for, for space objects that nobody feels responsible anymore for. <laughs> Uh, but when it comes to rules for space objects that are still active, uh, it should be more easy uh, because you have uh, somebody behind. And therefore, I'm also confident. Uh, and my, I always think, you know, it's it's the practitioners that should move forward as the first step, uh, uh, finding finding pragmatic solutions, uh, establishing de facto standards. Whatever is accepted between operators will be promoted to uh, regulation. That's that's my clear hope. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you so much, Holger. I fully agree. I want to say to, to you, to Michael, Jinyuan, uh, look, life is busy, hectic. And, um, you know, when you're doing this, there's five other things that you're not doing. So I appreciate that. And so thank you very much for being part of this. I think it was a really great conversation. As soon as we started chatting, I mean, it just kind of uh, took a life on its own. And, and, and it just, there's so much more to say, right? So, I mean, we could 
be here for quite a while longer. Uh, so that just tells me that there's more to unravel here. But uh, thank you for contributing to such an important topic of conversation. Great thing that this is not only live stream, but um, uh, is being recorded and will be available to a lot of other people so that they can rewatch or watch at their leisure. So I appreciate that. And of course, uh, you know, I appreciate spacewatch.global uh, um, for, for really hosting this, uh, you know, series of, uh, you know, webinars uh, on all these various topics. So with that, my final words to you is, um, I'm gonna pass it off to Torsten, but uh, from me um, to each and every one, one of you, you know, much love and aloha and um, agreeing with Michael, we can solve this. Um, I beckon to you to find ways to be empathetic and have compassion towards solving this problem. That's the thing that I'm gonna ask of uh, each and every one of you. And I thank you for that. And Torsten, back to you, my brother. Thank you. Um... It was another absolute outstanding discussion, I would say, and I love our bi-monthly gatherings are of, of free minds and talking very freely about the, situ uh, the situation and the things that matter. So it's a very unique format, format even in our Space Cafe series. And I mean, this morning we had a wonderful talk with um, Lloyd Demp in, in Australia from, from Southern Launch. Um, of course, completely different uh, direction he took. But um, yeah, I love what, what you do, um, Moriba, for the community and also f on, on our platform. So there are a few other events uh, lined up, as you can see here. And before we finish this day here, just want to guide you through. Tomorrow, we uh, touch another very hot topic. Um, it's a wide label event with Powering Space. Um, the Elephant in the Room 2.0, the second edition uh, of a discussion about um, addressing abuse and harassment in the space sector. Um, on the 12th, I have the great chance to speak with Ricardo Conde from the, Port the uh, Director General of the Portugal Space Agency about their plans. On the 19th, uh, I will spend my 33 minutes with Chris Kunstetter from AXA Earth Space about uh, space insurance. Um, then. There, you see, there's a gap. There's the Easter tree. Uh, we have our Easter break. Um, so not so many events uh, at that time. But on the 26th, I will come back with my 33 minutes with the Director General of OISPA in Prague, Rodrigo da Costa. I'm really looking forward to that. Then we are following our, on the 28th with another wonderful Space Cafe Scotland by the outstanding Angela Mattis, and we don't tell you who her guest will be. And on the 29th, our, we have another episode of our Space Cafe Canada by the wonderful Dr. Jessica West. All these events are going to be online on Eventbrite, and as always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn, or send us your request for a guest. I mean, we are open to that. Uh, that's your show. We don't do that for us. We do that for you, the audience. So, but don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you treat yourself with something special, become a real space watcher and you see it with Moriba. It goes well also in black. So, um, or become a space watch global supporter. We also go for that. Thank you very much for your interest today. And thank you Moriba, um, Michael, Holger, and Yi Wang for this inspiring our talk and being our guests. And thanks to this entire team that's behind Space Watch for doing that. A great job done week by week. Hope you all would stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you next week or tomorrow or whenever. And um, yeah, in the meantime, follow us on, on our website or on social media and as always, don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. Bye-bye for now.